nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Okay, hello again. So we're going to continue our um, lecture series on biomems and bionanotechnology. Um, in the last lecture, I finished up by talking about uh, methods to manipulate fluids at the micro scale, and we're going to continue that discussion with the concept of dielectrophoresis. So let me briefly describe what dielectrophoresis is. So electrophoresis, as you recall, was just a movement of charge in a constant electric field. And dielectrophoresis actually is a concept which utilizes the dielectric properties of the materials. So the particle doesn't really have to be charged. The particle that you're trying to move or that you're trying to interact with does not have to have a charge. It actually can be neutral. And what you do is you have to create a spatially non-uniform field. Okay? So for example, if you just have a capacitor, then the field lines in the middle of the capacitor are straight and they are not uniform, I mean, they, are, they are uniform. Where at the edges, the field lines can be non-uniform. Okay, so you can actually have a gradient at the edges. Well, if you can actually create a gradient of electric field, okay, which is a spatial non-uniformity, and the best way to describe that is by using a pin and a pad. So if you have a pin electrode and a pad electrode, and you apply a field between these two, then the field lines will actually look like this. And this region right here has a high field gradient, and this region right here has a low field gradient. Okay? What happens when you have this non-uniform, spatially non-uniform field is that the, the dipole within the particle, the induced dipole, is also non-uniform. You have a higher accumulation of charges on this side than you have on this side of the particle. And hence, there is a non-uniform dipole that is created in the particle, and that dipole interacts with the field outside uh, in a very interesting way, and that there's a force that's, that's developed, and this force is called dielectrophoretic force. The simplest approximation of the dielectrophoretic force is given here in this equation. It's a function of the volume of the particle. There's this R cube term, uh, assuming the particle is a, is a sphere here. Um, and then you have two additional parameters. There is this term, which is a gradient of the electric field magnitude squared. So that represents whether you have a field gradient or not. If your field lines are all straight and there's no gradient anywhere, then this term is zero and the force is zero. So you want to maximize the electric field gradient. Okay? And uh, a very Im important term then is the real part of this parameter which is called the clausius mozotti factor, FCM. It's called the clausius mozotti factor. And this is a function of the dielectric constant of the particle. Actually, it's a function of the complex dielectric constant of the particle. So this epsilon P minus epsilon M over epsilon P plus 2 epsilon M, where epsilon is the complex dielectric constant. Each one of these parameters is the complex dielectric constant. So what happens here is the following. If you're medium has a dielectric constant of epsilon m, and now you have a particle that has a dielectric constant that is larger than that of the medium, then this term, let's say, is positive, and what happens is that the particle will feel a force that will want to move it towards the region of the highest field gradient. So this particle will experience a force that would want to move it towards the tip of the electrode. Whereas if the dielectric constant of the particle was less than that of the medium, then you can actually, the, what will happen is that the particle will experience a force that would want to move it away from the region of the higher field gradient. In this case, this term ends up being negative, and you get what it really means is the force is in the opposite direction to the region of the highest field gradient. So this can be a nice way to manipulate charged or uncharged entities that have a dielectric constant that is different than the background. That's really what you're after. If the dielectric constant is the same as in that of the medium, then this term is going to be zero and there'll be no force. Okay, now it's also interesting to note, and this is what makes the DP very interesting, is that uh, the dielectric constant, as we all know, it's also a function of frequency. So hence, you can actually change the frequency of the signal and you can have an extra knob, you can change the frequency of the signal and get and change the dielectric constant of the particle and hence manipulate it in different directions. 
So the simplest way to actually make an interdigitated, uh, t uh, t uh, to make a non-uniform field gradient is to use an interdigitated electrode on a chip. So what's shown here, this, this image here, is basically the top view of these interdigitated electrodes. Okay, so you have these fingers that are connected between this electrode and then there's another electrode here that has these fingers that are interdigitated. And then you define them within a microfluidic channel with a flow, let's say, going from left to right. So um, if you take, for example, the case of polystyrene beads, small microparticles or nanoparticles, these beads, let's say polystyrene, their dielectric constant actually is pretty much always less than the medium, most of the physiological medium. So let's say DI water or something like that. Um, then the polystyrene beads dielectric constant will be less than that of the medium, and this particle will always experience what's called negative DEP. Okay? Cells, on the other hand, let's say mammalian cells or bacteria or different types of cells, can actually have both negative or positive DEP depending on frequency because their dielectric constant can actually be larger or greater than the medium. Okay? At high frequencies, let's say something in the order of greater than, greater than 100 kilohertz or so, um, cells experience positive DEP. Okay? Their dielectric constant is larger than that of medium and hence they experience positive DEP. So now, in this case of electrodes, on a surface in a chip, you have these electrodes shown here as these dark lines. If you actually simulate and plot the gradient of the electric field magnitude squared, so on this slide, actually, this is the gradient, then you see that the gradient is actually the maximum around the edges of the electrodes. Okay, And this is actually, um, intuitively, this is obvious because when you apply an electric field between the electrodes, the electric field lines will go like this between the electrodes and they will actually mostly concentrate, you know, around these edges, basically. So around the edges, then, the field gradient is high, and that's what this curve shows. Okay, this, these different lines are at different positions above the electrode. So if you have a particle which is experiencing negative DEP, then what's going to happen is that this particle will actually get pushed away from the edges, which is a region of highest field gradient, and it will then get pushed away and actually towards the top surface, towards the, towards the roof, towards the ceiling of the, of the channel. Whereas if you have cells, let's say, that experience positive DEP, it will actually get pulled towards these regions of the highest field gradient, which is these edges of the electrode. Okay. So using this concept, you can actually make microfluidic filters, for example. Again, another way to make a filter, which is a non-mechanical filter. So you can have a channel let's say where you have fluid flow coming in, you have electrodes that are defined. Now this is, I'm looking at the figure that's in the top left corner of your slide. Uh, electrodes, and then you have these particles that can be trapped if you apply the right voltage with the right frequency, and as long as you can balance and make sure that the dielectrophoretic force is larger than the other fluidic forces that the particle is experiencing. This is a cross-section of a typical device, let's say, that might be made where you have this channel with a certain depth and electrodes that are shown here defined at the bottom of the electrode. So you can actually do, um, uh, do microfluidic uh, modeling for such a system where you have a particle in a particular flow direction with different electrodes, and you can actually um, uh, take into account the various forces that this particle is experiencing. And this includes the dielectrophoretic force, um, the uh, fluid flow velocity force, uh, sedimentation force, etc. And we've published this in more detail in a paper uh, in JMEMS that you can go look up. So what you can do then is that you can simulate, I'm going to uh, actually show it right here, actually a few slides later on slide 20. Um, you can take into account all the various forces. You can take into account the dielectrophoretic force, the sedimentation force, which is due to basically the mass of the particle, the hydrodynamic drag force, which is due to the flow velocity and the radius of the particle. Um, you can assume a parabolic flow, laminar flow profile. And taking into account all these forces, and then you can actually simulate um, uh, the various forces. So for example, here shown on this slide, is the vertical dielectrophoretic force that the particle experiences um, when, when it's actually experiencing negative DEP. 
Uh, and what you see here is basically that at the edges here, you have the highest field gradient and, has, and hence the highest force. And this force is basically going to push the particles that are on the that that are in this region. It'll push them away from the edges, essentially. Okay. So, using these um, uh, simulation and, and experimental results, you can actually get plots like this, which are the characteristic of one of these dielectrophoresis filters, which shows trapping of beads, which would be for negative DEP, or trapping of microorganisms, which would be for positive DEP. So this curve on the left shows the flow rate, okay, in microliters per minute in one of these devices versus the voltage squared. And we plot the voltage squared because if you recall, there was an electric field square term in the dielectrophoretic force. So if you plot it as voltage squared, then you get a straight line. And this voltage is really what's called the holding voltage or the blocking voltage, okay? So essentially, in a fluid flow at this flow rate, what is the voltage that you need, the minimum voltage that you need to hold a particle? And this is uh, the results, the blue, uh, points are actually experimental data and the red line is actually simulation data and done here for two different sides of beads so smaller beads actually need a larger voltage for them to be trapped because if you recall the DEP force was a function of volume um, and a smaller bead will actually take more voltage and more force to actually trap it um, and the plot on the right actually shows these experiments with actual biological entities and hence these are experiencing positive DEP. They are getting pulled towards the electrodes. And this is done for Listeria monocytogenes, uh, uh, sorry, Listeria inaqua, which is a non-pathogenic version of, Lister uh, of Listeria monocytogenes, uh, Bacillus cereus spores, yeast cells, and even a, a vaccinia virus. Okay. Let me now show you very briefly the um, actually examples of this flow using a video. Oops, so I think I need to... Um, okay, so I'll come back and show this later, actually. We're going to continue with our presentation. Um, and you can then do the same thing with the dielectrophoretic um, uh, trapping. You can do this with viruses. So in this particular case, what you see here is um, the same thing done with virus particles. So on the, on the top right is a fluorescent image where these particles were labeled with either um, red or um, uh, green dyes and you can see these little particles trapped at the edges of these electrodes. Um, same thing here in this image, you actually see these little green particles at the edges of the electrodes um, and this were done in a microfluidic device um, shown here, a, a cross section is, is uh, shown right here on the, on the bottom left of your slide. Okay, and you can also actually look at what happens when the particle size becomes smaller and smaller. And in this particular case, you have to really, what you have to do is take into account the Brownian motion and the Brownian forces. So what you're really trying to do is, as a particle becomes very small, then the Brownian motion becomes more and more important. And you need to make sure that you apply enough voltage to be able to overcome the Brownian forces for that for that particular size of particle. And this was shown here, it's the particle diameter as it gets smaller versus the release voltage. So as you make the particle size very smaller, then you actually, the release voltage actually increases. Um, and you need to apply a larger voltage to actually trap these small particles. Okay. Now, um, I also I just want to briefly mention uh, a technique called micro uh, PIV, particle imaging velocimetry, that is used to characterize these fluids at the micro scale. So, when you are flowing these fluids, how do you know, uh, you know, what the flow lines are? How do you know to do actual experimental characterization of the fluid flow? And one way to do it is to actually use this micro PIV technique. Uh, Professor Weirly at Purdue here um, has done a lot of work in this area, and I got this slide from him, uh, which, uh, with work that we did together, actually. This is a, a device, so what you, in this case, what you do is you set up um, uh, the system where you flow fluorescent beads into your solution, okay? And you use these beads, and you use them to um, 
experimentally determine um, where the beads are flowing and you can then estimate the actual velocity vectors and velocity profiles and actually experimentally characterize the flow rate through your microfluidic device. So there's quite a bit of literature on this PIV and micro PIV and you can refer to that more if you're interested. Okay. So now we're going to actually continue um, and move on to the next topic, which is how can I, I mean, how can I use these concepts in fabrication, uh, the knowledge that now you have in micro and cell biology, and also in microfluidics to actually make biochip sensors and devices. So let me move to actual devices, and in these uh, BioMEMS biochip sensors, you are really trying to detect, you know. Uh, all sorts of different entities, and these uh, the the entities of interest could range from cells that could be that could be mammalian, plant, etc., microorganisms like bacteria, could be viruses, there could be proteins, there could be DNA, or there could be small molecules. So depending on what you are trying to detect, you have to actually go and pick the right detection scheme and the right methodology of detection. And in general, what I would, uh, what I have done is to characterize these detection methods in three basic approaches, which is either optical, electrical, or mechanical approaches at these micro and nanoscales in the biochip sensors. So that's what I'll do here is describe actually these sensing methods in biochips uh, and divide them up into these three categories of mechanical detection, electrical detection, and optical detection, and then go through them one at a time, describe some basic principles, gives you, and also along the way give you device examples. Okay, so let's talk about mechanical detection. Mechanical detection um, in micro devices can be achieved through uh, these mechanical sensors, or most often the uh, the best example of that is a micro cantilever uh, sensor. Okay, and in this case, what you're doing is that you make basically a very thin membrane um, or a structure like a cantilever, shown here on the right. This is a this is a sort of a V-shaped cantilever that's surface micro machine. You can also have this in a bulk micro machine fashion. Another one right here, shown on the bottom right, is also a bulk micro machine cantilever. And you can think of these cantilevers as a diving board in a swimming pool. So you really have a little swimming pool here that you have built, and this is a diving board. So this very thin membrane then is allowed to move. It's basically very thin and long. This one here is 0.2 microns thick. And, and 100 microns long. Now, um, what happens is the following, that if you actually perform a chemical reaction on one side of this cantilever, then uh, you can change the surface stress, okay? And that's the, the change in surface stress then actually then results in a change in deflection. And this is given by this equation here, which is called Stoney's equation. So Stoney's equation basically dictates that you have, um, if you have a change in the surface stress, so, so delta sigma 1 is a change in the surface stress on the top surface, delta sigma 2 is a change in surface stress on the bottom surface. And if you can somehow create this change in surface stress, then that will result in a change in deflection of the cantilever, and you can detect this deflection. Okay, so change in surface stress can actually result from a change in chemical reaction. So what happens is that if you perform a chemical reaction on one side of the cantilever and not the other side, then you're going to change the surface stress because the surface energy changes. And the change in surface free energy results in a change in surface stress. So this was originally actually demonstrated by um, IBM and some other groups that actually showed that you have, if you take a cantilever, an, an array of cantilever, and you attach, for example, in this case, DNA molecules, as shown here, DNA molecules. So you put your um, uh, probe here, one, let's say one, one particular type shown here in blue, and then a different probe molecule on a different cantilever. So this cantilever, for example, can be gold-coated. You can have a very thin layer of gold on them. And then the molecules can have a thiol group, as we discussed earlier. And using that sulfahydryl chemistry, you can attach these DNA molecules to uh, the surface of the cantilever. Now, when you bring in a complementary strand, shown here in green, then the complementary strand, this is a complementary strand to this red molecule. So this will bind, and as it binds to this, there's actually a change in surface energy, and that results in a change in surface stress, and the cantilever actually bends downwards. So what you see here is that as a function of time, 
you can measure the signal and this differential signal this is really the difference in nanometers so you can clearly see that in this case um, at the time that let's say you introduce the second molecule uh, there's a clear very very measurable bending of at least you know seven to ten nanometers uh, which is then quite easily measurable using uh, optics of an AFM by shining a laser beam here so what you do is you actually shine a laser beam on on this surface and then it's reflected back and you can detect that using a quad position detector so you can detect the the bending of this laser beam very very precisely so this this really is a very nice way to uh, achieve uh, biomolecular recognition or biochemical biomolecular detection um, that is label free and that's really a, a key point here that I want to stress that this is a label free method which means that you do not have to label your molecules in any way using optical or uh, any other labels uh, if you recall in the optical sensing with the attachment chemistry on a surface that we talked about we were detecting that using you know some fluorophore let's say or the presence of some bead or some other structure well this is just two molecules interacting and giving you a signal that is actually a, um, um, uh, that is actually a mechanical signal in this case and the two molecules don't need any label on them okay and uh, so using this micro cantilever stress sensors you can also detect different proteins and there is an ex example here from um, Arun Majumdar's group and Tom Tundit's group from Oak Ridge um, they actually uh, demonstrate very nicely that you can detect PSA, which is um, actually a cancer marker in 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 blood. Uh, it, uh, PSA is called it, it stands for uh, prostate specific antigen, and you can actually find an antibody for PSA. And for people who have uh, who are at risk of uh, prostate cancer or have developed prostate cancer, then the concentration of PSA in their blood would actually is increased. So if you can look for PSA in blood, then that's an indication of prostate cancer. So um, what's shown here is actually the PSA concentration. Actually, let me sh uh, t uh, talk about this curve on the bottom right first. As a function of time, you can measure the deflection again. And what you see here is that this red line is for no PSA. And there's some data here for no PSA. And there's the, uh, uh, there's the appropriate controls. But when you actually inject the PSA at different concentrations, then you see different levels of increase in the cantilever bending. Okay? And in this particular case, what they did was they attached the antibodies for PSA on the cantilever surface first, and then introduced the PSA in the solution. When the binding takes place, it actually changes the bending of the cantilever. All right? Another example of a stress sensor is uh, what's shown here. On the left here, um, you actually have a cantilever that has a polymer, a PMMA-based hydrogel polymer that's been patterned on the cantilever. Now, these polymers are environmentally sensitive, and actually um, they can be tailored to be sensitive to pH, as an example. You can also get these polymers such that they are sensitive to um, uh, temperature, for example. But the ones we used here was a, was a pH-sensitive polymer. And basically what happens is that as the pH of the medium around this changes, specifically around the pKa of this polymer, so when you are in a range of about 5.7 to about 6.7, then the polymer actually dramatically expands. The polymer actually swells and expands. And as it expands, then it actually bends the cantilever. And then again, using a laser or just optics, in, um, uh, laser interferometry, you can actually detect this bending of uh, the cantilever. So we show here uh, the deflection at the tip as a function of the pH. And you can see that in this range where the polymer expands, there's a dramatic increase in deflection. This is actually in tens of microns. And you get a very, very sensitive pH sensor in this range. So you have a narrow range. You have a small dynamic range but you have a very very high sensitivity and the sensitivity can be in the order of uh, 1 to 10 times 10 to the minus, uh, times 10 to the minus 5 delta pH change in pH okay the other types of mechanical sensors that I want to talk about is what's called uh, mass sensors okay so these are you also again use a micro cantilever based systems but you use them as mass sensors 
And the basic idea here is that um, that the resonant frequency of any structure, you know, you can actually uh, calculate it using the simplified expression of a of a harmonic oscillator or a pendulum, where the resonant frequency is given by one over two pi k over m square root, where m is the effective mass, okay, of the of the cantilever. Uh, this equation is derived for this, the scenario where you have a string where all the mass is assumed to be at the edge. Okay. So for that, uh, that kind of a structure, this is the resonant frequency. And um, what you essentially, the basic idea here is that um, if this cantilever is vibrating at a certain natural resonant frequency, then you add a small mass to it. So if you look at the, the loaded resonant frequency, and you add a small mass to this, so m star is a starting mass, and delta m now is your new added mass, then the new resonant frequency will change by a certain amount. And if you can measure that, then you can actually measure the presence of this added mass. So delta m, which is this new added mass, is given by this equation. You can subtract, you can solve for delta m from using these two equations. And essentially, uh, delta m then depends on your ability to, to detect this change in the resonant frequency. Okay? And as, as you make the structures very small, then the added mass can have a more pronounced effect on your resonant frequency. If you obviously have a very large, let's say, huge cantilevers that are many foot long, let's say, uh, if you were to add a small particle, a cell on that, then the added mass is very, very small compared to the starting mass. Whereas if the starting mass is very small, then added mass then you know can be measured much more easily. So um, the way you measure this resonant frequency is actually by um, using either optical signal again. You can shine a laser beam and then measure the reflected signal here and and look at that. Uh, uh, look at the bending of the cantilever that way, or you can introduce piezo resistors in this region of the cantilever. You can form a resistor here in this region and measure the bending or the vibration of this cantilever using electrical means. So what's shown here on the bottom right is a figure of the resonant frequency. Uh, you actually see the amplitude. This is the amplitude with arbitrary units as a function of frequency. And you can drive these cantilevers using uh, a piezoelectric stage. So essentially, what you do in that case, you take the chip which has the cantilever, and you actually um, put the chip on a piezoelectric material, and then you apply a voltage and you change the frequency of that signal that you are driving the stage with. And when the applied frequency matches the resonant frequency, then you get this resonance peak shown here in in green. Okay. So this would be the resonance. So, so the resonant frequency of this structure would be somewhere right here. And in this particular case, you get a pretty high Q. In this case, we had a beam of uh, 10 microns with a thickness of uh, 30 nanometer. And the resonant frequency is about 270 kilohertz. Now, another interesting way to measure the resonant frequency is by what's called just getting a thermal noise spectrum. So in this particular case, for the thermal noise measurement, you actually don't apply any signal yourself. You just measure the noise vibration essentially all you do is you measure uh, the uh, vibration uh, uh, the the noise induced vibration of the cantilever so you don't apply any signal yourself you just have the thermal noise and the ambient noise that are moving this cantilever you take that signal and you take you know the fourier transform of that and you get this curve right here which is the amplitude again as a function of frequency, and in this case again you can see that you you can see the small peak with a very low Q, but the peak is about the same value as the one with the piezoelectric uh, driven. So the bottom line is that the driven structures have a very high Q. The Q is high, whereas the thermal noise you get low Qs. Okay, but it is a low power method. In this case you have you don't apply any power to the system, but your Q is low. Okay. So using this structure, then, people have reported the detection of the mass of various species. For example, this is um, uh, shown for E. coli cells. So you have a cantilever structure, and you actually attach antibodies to that structure. And these antibodies can then specifically capture the cells of interest. And then you can measure the change in resonant frequency after you have captured the cells, and that can be an indication of the fact you've captured something when you measure the change in the resonant frequency. So what's shown here is um, the number of cells in this axis versus the frequency shift 
And the frequency shift in this case is, by the way, downwards. It's, it started as a positive number, but uh, the new frequency, the, the loaded frequency is larger. The omega loaded is actually larger. Um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Is less than the omega unloaded. So the shift is actually negative. Okay. But in this case, the shift is linear uh, to the number of added cells, which should make sense. Uh, and from this also, you can extract the mass of a single cell. Uh, and you can, here you can see actual curves of th um, the resonant frequency as a, fun uh, as a function of the vibration uh, of the amplitude here, which is really the the optical detector output. And you can see that for 800 cells, you have uh, you know this is the this is the initial signal, and then once you add the mass 800 cells, you get the new one right here on the left. It actually the frequency shifts downwards and the shift is decreased as you have smaller and smaller masses. Okay. Uh, this is an actual picture then of um, uh, the detection of the mass of Listeria cells. You see uh, a cantilever here on the top left, which is a surface micromachine cantilever. You can see these side walls, which are nice uh, crystal facets. And this is a thin silicon cantilever, um, and it has a bunch of these little spots. And if you zoom in, you'll see that these are actually bacteria. These are actually listeria cells. And also, again, you can see the number of cells. As you increase the number of cells, then the resonant frequency shift increases. And this can be very uh, uh, sensitive uh, mass detectors. Now, if you just look into what is the minimum detectable mass, so actually uh, there's been equations that have been derived uh, by Rukus and group at Caltech that explored the minimum d uh, uh, minimum mass that can be detected um, that is really thermomechanical noise limited. So uh, now the, the detection of the minimum mass is actually also a function of how well you can detect uh, the shift in frequency. So the frequency measurement is actually limited by thermomechanical noise in the cantilever beam. So the minimum detectable frequency is given by this equation. It's a function of the amplitude, and then you actually have uh, the Q here also, which should make sense because the larger the Q, which means the sharper your amplitude uh, or the resonant frequency curve is, the sharper it is, the smaller shift that you can easily detect. Okay, so. Um, you, you would like to get as high of a Q as possible in these mass sensors. And then using this equation, then you can extract the minimum detectable mass. And I can go through the theory with, with, uh, with whoever is interested offline. Um, the minimum detectable mass then is given by this equation right here. And if you actually um, plot this out as a function of one particular dimension, let's say the length, then this is the kind of curve you get. So this is the minimum detectable mass as a function of length of, the, of a cantilever, where the width is fixed at 1 micron, and the thickness is fixed at 10 nanometer, which is 100 angstroms. And we have done this for two Q values. So for Q of 5, your minimum detectable mass is up here, okay? which means that you can detect masses above this. And as you increase Q, then the minimum detectable mass goes down, which makes sense. So it should be even with the Q of five, which is the case for for thermal for thermal driven, you get something in the order of you know Qs of a few, um, basically one to one to ten. Um, you can actually detect masses that in, is in the uh, femtogram range. Ten to the minus fifteen is one femtogram range. Whereas if you were to actually drive this. Uh, and you get Qs of a few hundred, let's say 500, then you can certainly get masses in the order of 10 to the minus 17 10, uh, to a few 10 to the minus 18 grams. Okay. So if we actually build some structures here, you can, this is an, an example of a process flow. I'm showing the cross-sectional process flow of making one of these surface micromachine cantilevers. Uh, you can start with an SOI wafer, which has an oxide and a silicon. Um, you can define the cantilever regions and then form another oxide. And then actually you can release these oxide coated cantilever structures and then finally re release the, uh, the, f the films completely by etching away the oxide. So this is the top view right here at the very end where you can get the cantilevers that are um, uh, released from the substrate. 
These are pictures of these cantilevers. Here is an array of these cantilevers on the top left within a microfluidic channel. So this is a channel that's actually many microns deep. And here is your cantilevers that are suspended at the edges. If you look at a close-up, this is a, sm a small cantilever that is about a micron or so wide, about four microns long. And this particular one is actually about 20 or so nanometers thick. Uh, it is pretty thin because you can actually see through it with an SEM. These are SEM pictures, and you can actually see through it. These Here there are three virus particles that are actually attached on the back side of the cantilever. So we've been working with vaccinia viruses, and here we're trying to detect the mass of these virus particles. And on this structure here, you can see that you actually have one virus particle attached. Um, and if you look at now the resonant frequency of these structures, then you can actually detect even a single virus particle. Um, shown here in uh, green is the unloaded resonant frequency. The starting resonant frequency was 1.27 megahertz. The Q was about 5, and this is the stiffness constant of the cantilever extracted by the Sailor's method. And uh, when you add the single particle to it, then the resonant frequency actually shifts downward by about 60 kilohertz, which is very measurable. So even with a thermal noise case, you have the sensitivity of a few femtograms in this case. And we know the measurement is real because we actually add different number of virus particles and then confirm that by SEM pictures, and you get this almost a straight line, which is with more particles, you actually get a higher resonant frequency shift. So the sensitivity here is something in the order of 6.3 hertz per atogram. Uh, the mass of one of these vaccinia viruses is about 10 femtograms, and actually um, we have work ongoing to attach uh, antibodies on these cantilevers. We've done it since then, and, and it'll be published soon. And actually, it's shown here. Uh, we can also take these cantilevers and attach specific antibodies to them. There's a layer of BSA with streptavidin and then a biotinylated antibody that is selective to these capture uh, to the viruses. And you can actually selectively capture vaccinia virus amongst a mix of other particles. Um, one very interesting thing happens um, when you go down to nanoscale uh, on these mechanical structures, and I'll just use this one slide to just show that that what you see here is that um, in, the, in all these equations that I showed you, for example, back on slide um, 33, that the resonant frequency is given by k over m square root. Okay? And we usually assume that m changes when we add the mass, and we usually neglect any changes in stiffness constant in k. Well, when you make the cantilever's nanoscale dimension, now coming back to slide um, 39, uh, you cannot really ignore that change in K anymore because the cantilevers are so thin. If, you, if you're working with a 10 to 20 nanometer thin cantilever, that's about the same thickness as the thickness of a protein layer. A protein might be in the order of 50 to 100 angstroms thick. So when we attach this protein layer, they actually significantly change the stiffness constant of this cantilever along with changing the mass. So what you see here is two scenarios. Uh, the red line here is the unloaded resonant frequency of one of these structures at 2.7 megahertz. When you attach the antibodies, you actually are adding some mass. But the change in mass in this case actually is more dominant than the change in the stiffness constant. And the new resonant frequency still goes down. Okay? And then when you capture the virus, then it further goes down again, shown here in the blue curve. So this all makes sense. But the curve on the right is very interesting. You start with the unloaded resonant frequency, which is this red curve. Okay? Now, when you actually, in this particular cantilever, when you attach the antibody, the resonant frequency actually goes up. It actually increases. And that can happen only if the change in the stiffness constant is more dominant than the change in the resonant frequency. And hence, the resonant frequency can actually increase. The new resonant frequency can increase. So you have to take that into account when you do these measurements on very thin structures. And now when you add a virus onto that, then the resonant frequency actually comes down again, goes from here to here, which again makes sense. Okay. And um, the reason of why this happens, it has to do with, the, with your design rules of the dimensions of the cantilever versus the thickness and related parameters, and also the thickness of your antibody layers and its mechanical properties. Uh, so depending on all these parameters, you have to pick the right dimensions of the cantilevers such that your resonant frequency always goes down. 
Uh, here is another example from Craighead's group, which made these SY cantilevers. Um, again, shown here, there's a nice little picture. And in this particular case, they actually had uh, a gold pad here on which they attached thiolated molecules and actually measured the mass of individual small uh, nanoparticles or beads that were captured onto, um, onto this region. Okay, so that was a quick review of mechanical, micro and nanomechanical sensors. Let me now move to electrical or electrochemical detection methods and how these methods are used in uh, bioMEMS and uh, biosensors uh, at the micro and nano scale. Uh, there's three ways, there's three categories of electrical or electrochemical sensors, what I would call imperimetric methods potentiometric methods or conductometric methods, okay? And let me briefly then give you examples of, of these types. There's actually a few other types of electrical sensors also, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So imperimetric uh, is actually uh, the idea that you are actually measuring uh, some sort of a redox reaction at an electrode surface, okay? Uh, and in this case, the most common example that um, uh, people have performed is the detection of uh, glucose using a glucose oxidase film. So the idea here is that if you take um, uh, glucose and actually uh, have oxygen and water and you have this enzyme called glucose oxidase on a working electrode and then you have a reference electrode, if you actually apply a small voltage to this then what happens is that actually um, the glucose oxidase will react will actually, uh, it's, a, it's an enzyme, it will convert glucose into gluconic acid plus H2O2. And then H2O2 is reduced at uh, minus 600 millivolts at a reference electrode that you also have there. So using this reaction, you can actually detect electrochemically uh, the presence of glucose in your starting sample. And it has been demonstrated that you can also detect lactate and urea. Um, you can take this enzyme, and there's different ways now to put this enzyme on the electrode. You can put it in a gel and find a way to coat the gel on the surface. That's one way. Uh, in these sensors, the issue of surface regeneration and sensor reusability is, is something that you really need to be concerned about and make sure that you look at the, uh, how many times a particular sensor can actually be used. Okay. One other example that's more uh, nanoscale uh, is this, uh, detection of DNA using electrochemical means and detection of DNA hybridization to be more specific. And this is actually technology that was published and then recent and then, uh, um, and then after that was uh, actually licensed by Morola and Morola is actually working on uh, commercializing uh, this general approach by making disposable sensors uh, that would have an electronic output. So in this case, the goal is to be able to detect the hybridization of DNA using electronic means. And what they do, it, it's actually a complicated scheme here, but it's very interesting. What they do is actually they attach capture probes to the electrode surface. So you have a gold electrode, and you attach your capture probe using thiol groups, okay? What happens is then, then you get your target DNA Basically, you, you, know, you get it to bind, so this is your target DNA, and you can bind that to your capture probe. So here is what, for example, shown here, this alkane linker um, attached to a thiol, and then on the other hand, you have, on the other side, on top, you have the capture probe. Now, the way you have to design this capture probe is that it, it should bind to part of your target nucleic acid, not all of it. And then you also, in the solution, you introduce DNA sequences called signaling probes and the rest of your target sequence right here should actually bind to the signaling probes, okay? Then what happens is that these signaling probes, the other half of the signaling probe has actually these ferrocene labels, okay? So the way this molecule will, will bind is that this ferrocene label would actually get exposed to the surface. The molecule will have to lie like this to, for it to bind to the, uh, to the capture probe. And then these ferrocene labels here on this side of the signaling probe right here would actually uh, transfer um, electrons to um, small molecules that act as molecular wires. Okay, so it's a pretty interested, complicated approach, but it uh, you know 
it's 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 really novel and very nice. Um, so you take the you attach your capture probe, but then within the same SAM you also have these molecular wires or small molecules that would act as conductors, and you would also have regions uh, of molecules that would act as electrodes, for example. Um, so the signaling probes is really like a label in this case that acts as an electronic label, okay? And these ferrocene groups uh, are attached to part of the signaling probe. So once this scenario takes place that is shown on the schematic, then if you apply a voltage, then you can actually get the ferrocene groups to transfer charge to these molecular wires, and then you can measure that using these electrodes. So binding of the target sequence to both the capture probe and the signaling probe connects the electrode, the electronic labels to the surface, and you can the labels then transfer charges to the electrode surface, producing a signal. So you can actually get an electronic signal of hybridization of DNA. Okay, a second example of a sensor is what we call potentiometric sensors. Potentiometric sensors would be um, what you know, have commonly been also called ISFETs or CHEMFETs. These are basically measuring uh, potential differences. So the idea is that you create a potential difference between the, char uh, uh, between the gate of a FET and a reference electrode in the solution. So you have a reference electrode in the solution, you have a MOSFET with a drain source and a gate material, and then on the gate you have some sort of a capture or sensor layer, which could be the gate itself or something on the gate. And essentially, the change um, uh, when when your ions or analytes or DNA or proteins bind to this gate, then there's a change in potential, and this change in potential is converted to a change in charge or change in current by the FET. Um, or it can also be actually converted to a change in capacitance in low-doped silicon. The gate material then is sensitive, is designed to be sensitive to the specific target, and you can actually detect pH, specific ions, charges, or also molecules. Again, but in the case of molecules, you're really detecting changes in charges. Some examples of that, this is a nanoscale example of this potentiometric sensor uh, made using uh, silicon nanowires by uh, Lieber's group and they use them as pH sensors, so they actually take individual silicon nanowires and anchor them between source and drain electrodes. And then on these nanowires, they actually attached these molecules that basically would be able to protonate or deprotonate depending on the change in pH. So as you change the pH in the solution around the wires, then these groups, these amino groups that are attached, they would actually get protonated or deprotonated, and hence the change in the charge around the wire would change the conductivity of the silicon nanowire. So the silicon nanowires are useful because they have, they have a high surface area to volume ratio, and hence they can be very high sensitivity and can detect the presence of very small number of analytes because you have essentially the entire surface area of this wire can act as a gate. And uh, potentially, uh, the idea here is that since these are so small, these nanowires are in the order of uh, 5 to 8 nanometers, and potentially even attachment of a single entity here, of a single protein or single molecule, could alter the conductance. Okay. So they also demonstrated the detection of uh, streptavidin, which is a uh, close cousin of uh, this protein we talked about before called avidin. And they actually attached biotin to the silicon nanowire using BSA. So they had biotin-related BSA attached to silicon nanowire, and then streptavidin uh, was allowed to react to the biotin. And when streptavidin binds to this, then there's a change in charge around the wire, which changes then the conductivity and the current flow by changing the potential inside the wire. And they could detect in real time uh, the binding of these biomolecules. Again, these methods are um, label-free. This is one of the main attributes. And uh, they have the potential to detect molecules at very, very low concentration levels. Um, this structure shown before was individual nanowires that were then assembled on a substrate. Um, 
with the advances in silicon technology, you can also talk about making silicon nanowires using top-down methods with the advances in e-beam lithography and making nanoscale structures using top-down methods. So you can actually make these nanowires, silicon nanowires, which are um, connecting these two um, islands which have these gold electrodes and again the biochemical reactions on these nanowires would uh, uh, you know would then alter the change in conductance of these wires. Another example of potential metric sensor is that of field effect sensing of DNA and this was demonstrated by an analysis group um, at MIT where they actually made these cantilevers um, but then the cantilevers actually had an exposed area at the ends um, which really acted as a capacitor, as a silicon capacitor. Now in this particular case the use of cantilevers is really only to make these sensors such that they can be used in microfluidic systems but it didn't really, it didn't have to be cantilever, it could just be on a substrate. And the basic idea here is that the binding of the DNA, complementary strands of DNA, would actually change the potential in the silicon. So it would change the capacitance and the potential inside the silicon by changing the depletion layer in the silicon, and that change in capacitance then is actually measured. So you actually measure the surface potential here, and they could measure the changes in, in, in surface potential uh, when, uh, when complementary strands of DNA actually bind to each other. Okay, the third type of sensing method could be conductometric. And conductometric sensor really measure the changes in electrical impedance between two electrodes. So essentially you have two electrodes and um, that you could have changes that can be at an interface or in the bulk region or both. And that can be used to indicate biomolecular reactions between DNA, proteins, antigen-antibody reactions, or excretion of cellular products, for example. So you have two electrodes, you measure the impedance, whether it's DC resistance or impedance, um, but you measure this whole complex and changes that take place either at the interface or in the bulk uh, would then change the, the impedance signal and that would indicate that you actually have a biomolecular reaction or some sort of a chemical reaction taking place. An example of this would be this nanoparticle mediated DNA detection by Merkins group. In this case, what they did was they set up two electrodes, okay, and then in between the electrodes, you atta they attached these um, capture probes, and then nanoparticles uh, would get anchored to those sites only when you have the complementary strand. So you have a nanoparticle that's functionalized along with a target strand. When the target strand is present, then you actually have uh, the placement of these nanoparticles, and then the nanoparticles then are then further used to um, actually deposit silver between these two electrodes. So gold nanoparticles assemble between two electrodes. If the DNA is hybridized, then you actually do a silver reaction on the gold nanoparticles, and you measure the conductance between these two wires. So essentially you have made a wire that connects now these two electrodes through the nanoparticles, and you can detect the binding of the nanoparticles. Okay, we'll stop right here for this lecture, and then continue this material in the next one. Thank you.